the Full Circle Podcast, compelling interviews and incredible tales from Colorado's Western Slope, from the mountains to the desert. Christy Reese and her team hear from the movers, shakers, and characters of the Grand Valley and surrounding mountain towns that make the Western Slope the place we all love. You'll learn, you'll laugh, you'll love with the Full Circle. Hi, everyone. It's Christy Reese. Welcome back to the Full Circle Podcast. I am here today with Grand Junction City Manager, Greg Caton. Thank you for joining us, Greg. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You are a busy man. There's a lot of activity going on. There is a lot of activity going on. Tell me what you're most excited about right now that's going on in Grand Junction. I feel like it's our day in the sun, if mm-hmm. you will. And uh, so many people are moving in the right direction, pulling on the rope in the same direction. It's just great. I yeah. think Grand Junction has deserved it for many years. Our economy is, I believe, the most diversified it's probably ever been. Mm-hmm. And that you can do a lot of things when um, revenues are coming in and things yeah. are diversified. So it's great. That's exciting. I think we feel the same way in the real estate business. We're like, we're on the map. People are noticing us from all over. People are moving here from other communities that always were kind of beating us out. And now we feel like, oh, people want to come here. Most definitely. I think, unfortunately, it it, for many years thought we were kind of second choice. Or even when I came here, people were like, well, where are you headed to? Mm -hmm. Like this was a stepping stone. This is not a stepping stone. This is a wonderful community. Yeah. Growing all the time. What do you see in the growth in Grand Junction? What kind of numbers are we seeing? Yeah, so our sales tax, that's really a good measure for us of really economic activity. Uh, We don't really compare too much to 2020, of course, because of the pandemic. So we go back to 19 and it's double digits over 19. Mm -hmm. And also when we look at um, the different sectors, there's a number of different sectors that are doing well. And also uh, just driving down here in this beautiful location, I I think what we're starting to see is really the fruits of our labor from many years ago. And yeah. so we planted seeds and people were very excited about the first few years. I said, wait till you actually start seeing it go vertical. Yeah. And just much like west of here, we've been working on for many years on Dos Rios. People are going to start to see that activity in the latter part of this year, or early part of next year. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people don't realize how long some of these projects have been in the works. I mean, they may have heard about them a year ago, three years ago, five years ago, but the the seeds mm-hmm. started well before that. A, a good measure of that and reference this beautiful building we are here in Las Colonias. And that started actually in 16. Uh, I arrived in June of 16. And shortly thereafter, the bonsai had the, the opportunity to sell their headquarters. And we started mm-hmm. discussions about how do we keep them in Grand Junction? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, here we are five years later. And uh, now we have this beautiful building and this beautiful park. We're really excited to be here and wanted to talk to you about what you see coming next because we love being down here and we're ready for some restaurants to move (laughs) in out of this area. (laughs) I know. So we formed a partnership with uh, Las Colonias Development Corporation, LCDC, as we refer to it, and then also GJEP, Grand Junction Economic Development Partnership. Mm -hmm. And their opportunity or partnership for us is to help, one, fill out the the business park, but then also latter latter part of the development of the park was this idea um, of a plaza or some mm-hmm. type of restaurants to really add that mix um, because we obviously have the recreation elements, we have the business elements, and so there need to be kind of that restaurant component. Mm-hmm. And so I, I know there's been continued discussions in that regard with LCDC and GJEP. Awesome. Well, we look forward to inviting any businesses that would like to come down and open uh, some food, uh, any kind of food down here at the riverfront. We would be excited about it. Um, What are some of the biggest challenges we're facing right now in Grand Junction? I think one that comes to mind is housing. Mm -hmm. housing. And so what I have said, some of, we had challenges five years ago and thankfully uh, some of those have been solved or uh, reduced as far as challenges, but now we have some new challenges. And I certainly think the housing is one of those. Mm -hmm. I'm a Colorado native. And so I've seen communities all across the state uh, with that challenge. And unfortunately what I've said is when you're, you have that challenge, you never really solve it. Yeah. You work to, always chasing you're always that. chasing it. So I think fortunately it's not as bad as some communities had it when they started with policies and with initiatives. And so I'm hopeful that if we really invest in this and resource it, that we can make more progress than many of our counterparts across the state. But what the challenge is, is if you don't solve that problem, 
then it leads to other things such as transportation issues. Right. Yeah, this is it's an employment issue uh, if you can't have uh, a reasonable uh, place to live or places to live for employees, yeah. and so then it translates into the business community. So there is a huge ripple effect for sure. And one of, I guess, one of the advantages of us always feeling like we're a little bit behind some of the other markets in Colorado is we get to watch what happens mm-hmm. to them. And boy, are the resort towns feeling that to the yeah. nth degree. Um, I'm hearing that there are no place for people yeah. that work in the hotels and the restaurants to live in those communities. It's always been tough in the resort communities, but it's even more so now. I, I watch that. I read several uh, papers every morning of the mountain communities and other communities across the state. And you're exactly right. It was, And I think that's a good example of kind of pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, where mm-hmm. it certainly has a, exacerbated it as uh, certain challenges that mm-hmm. communities had, you know, in those mountain communities, they've had that for years and then now they have a real problem. Yeah. And unfortunately it, it's at a crisis point up in mm-hmm. Summit County. They were literally talking about uh, some significant uh, reactions to mm-hmm. that crisis. So being able to see that extreme level of housing problems in those communities, what are we as a city right. doing here so to try to combat that. We saw this coming about two years ago. So as we were developing the comprehensive plan, housing really started to emerge as a, a topic of concern. So we engaged a group called Root Policy, and they've been working with us to develop some uh, list of policies and action items for council's consideration. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're narrowing the finish line for that process. And that will give us kind of a roadmap over the next several years to to work towards uh, really uh, providing some relief in that area. And it's not just, there's not one solution. Right. Uh, it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. And we need to work with our community. Some are more palatable than others, and some are very dramatic. And we certainly aren't, aren't suggesting at this point that we start with some of those. And, and to your point, I've seen some of those more dramatic ones across the state that have not uh, been implemented the way the governing body thought they would be Mm -hmm. or the results. They didn't quite see the positive results. And so uh, we can learn from those others. We literally hired the best, Um, very impressed with the work that's coming out of there. And so we look for community feedback, industry feedback on that and to chart this course. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking for community feedback, how does that come to you? I mean, you do, are you still doing coffee with city manager? I do. So is that one place you get feedback from community and is it also at city council meetings? In a variety. I I, I answer my own phone um, and reply to emails and, and everything in between. And so, uh, we have over 700 staff members and we get feedback every wow, single day. 700. Yeah. We have uh, 708 authorized in the 2021 budget and, and next year, um, we're still developing the 2022 budget, but we'll be adding staff, particularly in the first responder area, uh, where voters in 2019 gave us the directive to mm-hmm. add three fire stations, add police officers. And so we really are in a growth mode of uh, staffing positions. And how surprising and wonderful was it to have an excess in the budget? I mean, to have excess funds this year. We did. So uh, to the point, uh, you know, a year ago when um, our 60% of our general fund comes from sales tax. Mm -hmm. And so when you have governor orders that tell people to stay home um, and not even show homes, for example, then that can certainly be a problem uh, in our community. Thankfully, we were very different than many other communities across the state. And so to your point there, we did did end up with revenues uh, over expenditures for 2020, uh, in large part because of our reductions in expenditures. Mm -hmm. So we did not have any layoffs or furloughs, but we kept a lot of positions open that just naturally are open or there were some vacancies that occurred. In addition to that, we did reduce some operating expenditures. And so I give credit to our staff who did a phenomenal job. Absolutely. They know their particular areas better than anybody else. And and they dug deep and found savings. And the the best thing about that is, for the most part, residents didn't see it. Yeah. And that's our what always our goal. Now then people say, Oh, you did it one year. Well they continue that, right? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> it was a pandemic and it was meant to be a cyclical uh, um, solution mm-hmm. versus a structural solution. The structural solution um, for our budget came in twenty sixteen. Um, shortly after I got here, uh, we had a cyclical and a structural imbalance and we right sized that. Um, unfortunately we had touched thirty one positions 
um, some of those um, part-time, some of those early retirement, and then certainly some... Yeah. Um, well, I, I can sympathize with you because um, early in my team building, uh, I hired a business coach and they said, let's start, let's start over. Like, let's scrap everything that you did before and start anew. And sometimes you have to do that, right? Just get rid of a lot of the fat and start over. And what a great foundation you've laid now. Yeah. And so what... Um, so there are a couple goals early on in my tenure that was objective one to um, right size really our organization and find those opportunities. We did that early on. It was kind of forced upon us because of the economic downturn. Mm -hmm. And two was to make investments uh, in such as in the business park, really get engaged in economic development. And our partners do a wonderful job. We outsource our economic development. Um, but uh, down here along the riverfront, we've taken a direct role in that. And also trying to be a good partner. Mm -hmm. And being a good partner is having our own house in order with our financial condition. And, and then also investing in areas where we only control. And what I mean by that is infrastructure and uh, first responders. And that is not by happenstance. That comes out of our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So we have a strategic plan uh, that we update every two years. And so a lot of this has been the result of that strategic plan. We didn't just think of it overnight. It was investing in our infrastructure, investing in first responders, diversifying our economy. And for the first time in many, many years, our economy is not as tied to oil and gas as it once was. The third quarter of 20, yeah. 2019, oil and gas dipped, uh, but yet our local GDP went up. That was a, obviously a sign of diversifying our economy, and that yeah. was the strategic initiative. Fantastic. Um, I think those of us that live here full time can see a lot of the things that are going on right now with the city, uh, not only down here at the riverfront. I mean, there's a ton of construction. Uh, there's the first street intersection, a uh, lot of activity there. There's sidewalk improvements going on in the downtown core. So lots of money being spent on improving the city. We have over $85 million that we'll be investing uh, in capital infrastructure throughout our community in 2021 and will likely be that same number or maybe even a little bit higher for 2022. The sidewalks is a good example, and I'm really proud of our roads here. I think our roads, are the con there's two components. One is the, the condition of them, mm -hmm. and two is expansion, um, handling growth. We've invested in both those areas. Happy to talk more about that. But the sidewalk pro program, um, many other cities struggle with that, and we've invested in that. We put $400,000 investing in our sidewalks in 2021, and that will continue. Uh, that's not just a one and done. You continue to invest in the infrastructure. It's like the roads. Uh, we put a lot of over $5 million each year in maintenance of that. So mm -hmm. over a $250 million asset when you look at the system. Yeah. And now we're investing uh, $70 million in expansion up in 24 and G. And also what will happen is there'll be significant economic activity up there in a few years. It's Absolutely. already going on. People go, wow, yeah. look at this economic activity. Well, when communities have seen a direct investment in economic development in areas where they invest in transportation. Mm -hmm. It's really important to look ahead, mm -hmm. isn't it? You don't want to get caught. No. <laughs> I often say we're working with city council, you know, we're re looking at five and 10 years out. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking at tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at tomorrow, then it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> it yeah. reminds me of those little kids when you play soccer and when you're we're really little, you know, they're just like that little pack. And right. They just look right at around your, the ball. Yeah. And they just <laughs> look at dirt. their, and they look at their feet. If we're looking at our feet, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be looking downfield. Yeah. Well, uh, let's circle back to housing a little bit because, of course, that's our uh, main area of focus here. But um, lots of building going on. Uh, what do you see from the city perspective on, on that and the planning department? Sure. So we're seeing a lot. Uh, obviously, and this you know this from the business too, what we'll also see is the commercial follows the the rooftops. So we'll have a surge here of the rooftops. Um, and then the commercial activity will start to flow after that. We've seen some interest in uh, industrial space, if you will. And so that's, uh -huh. that's kind of a new and emerging, which is great. Right. For the I've, seen, I've seen some pretty big sales happening yeah. in the industrial sector. So that's really nice. But uh -huh. as far as the residential um, in the housing study, it says we're a couple thousand units short. We're undersupplied, and, and we see that. You see that on yeah. the short uh, days on market, um, at least for listings. But then also just people are interested pre-pandemic and then 
pandemic, they're even more interested in Grand Junction. Just like you said earlier, I yeah. agree. I've heard say we're on the map. We're on the map, and so we're gonna we're gonna see that residential construction for quite a while. Um, what's really important? We just finished uh, the comprehensive plan which had significant uh, community input. So that's our roadmap mm -hmm. over the next 10 years. And again, uh, being a Colorado native, we can't say no to growth. Yeah. We cannot say no to growth. Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Colorado Springs. Okay. And wow. Talk yes. about change. Yes. Um, my parents moved there in 1970. It was 100,000 people. And they left in about 2,000 when it was about a half a million people. Yeah, um, and, and then now, it's even what are growing they, two million more. Yeah, now it's, or it's really significant growth. Yeah, so you don't say no to it. You can't, um, but what you do is you manage it. Yep. Uh, you manage the growth. I think even for sometimes neighbors, they think density is a bad word. Density is important. Yeah. Because if you either have a trade off between density or, or sprawl, sprawl, and those are the extremes. Yeah. And we need to find where that balance is for us. So mm -hmm. you'll start to hear more about sustainability. Um, trail connection, connection in general, road connection, um, and density as mm -hmm. we move forward. Now, appropriate density. Um, it's not just density at any measure, but um, we do not want to have sprawl. That would be really unfortunate because we have looked across the state and, and even beyond the state boundaries for, for models that we don't want to uh, follow. Exactly. Yeah. And um, the downtown obviously would love to have more density down there. What kind of initiatives are, are the city doing to try to foster that? So we have one of the longest standing downtown development authorities in the state, and they do a wonderful job. Um, and, and part of that is uh, funding through tax increment financing. So we refer to that as TIF. So the city provides those TIF dollars mm -hmm. to the DDA on an annual basis uh, to really partner uh, and really look at those strategic investments. And they've done a phenomenal job in that area. One of the things that I know the DDA is working on and is really key is the 24-7. And meaning by that, they need residential. You need residential on the downtown to really give it that life. Yeah. And the opposite of that, just to paint the picture for people, is you have employment-based downtown. That's wonderful. But at 5 o'clock, people would drive home. They drive away out of that downtown. That doesn't make a healthy downtown yeah. uh, nightlife and environment. Well, I mean, my restaurants, all of that entertainment. Uh, full-time residents downtown provide that. So mm -hmm. continuing to focus on residential downtown will be really important. And then also look for street, uh, strategic redevelopment opportunities. And there's a number that we're got a little bit premature to mention specifics on, but uh, coming soon. Come on, to, Greg. I come know, on. I know. I, <laughs> coming soon to a downtown near you. <laughs> <laughs> Downtowns are the heart and soul of any community. We have the best downtown there is with a beautiful uh, serpentine street that uh, was really pushing the envelope uh, yeah. nearly 50 years ago. And so we've got the bones there and wonderful restaurants and, and uh, other establishments downtown, retail, just the whole mix. Mm -hmm. So we need to support them. That's really important. So definitely, downtown, definitely. supporting the core, supporting the heart of the community. So we do have a, we call it a redevelopment area. And uh, there's some basically reduction in fees in that area. And we expanded that area to include some strip of uh, 6 and 50 down in Orchard Mesa to really help facilitate that type of redevelopment. And there's a lot of opportunities in our community. Yeah, I agree. Um, how about uh, the marijuana issue? Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? And what would you like people to know about where that stands right now? Yeah, so we received voter authorization to really, it was prohibited before. And so now they really re eliminated that prohibition and city council is working through the regulations. We've received a lot of uh, community input and continue to have discussions uh, at the city council level that lots of attendance mm -hmm. uh, from community members and industry members, lots of feedback there. We were hoping to have the regulations completed uh, really fall. Uh, that might be um, pushed just a little bit, I would maybe say by the end of the calendar year. And then that's really just for the retail stores. Um, and then if there were other regulations that needed to be uh, develop such as uh, manufacturing, potentially uh, growing things of that nature, then that could come later. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we could see, we'll see stores potentially in 2022. 2022. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of potential there. Like you said, um, whatever side of the issue you're on, um, 
it's interesting to see Grand Junction going through those issues again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess what I would say that's beneficial is if, if people are maybe struggling to accept that is we did put in the question, the focus utilization of the dollars for parks and recreation. And so, um, should that, uh, regulation and these stores come to fruition, which we are anticipating, that will be a significant revenue source for parks and recreation. And, and in my opinion, that's much needed. I mean, of course it is, but I think that the more people we draw here to this community uh, with our trails and our open space, we've got to maintain it. We've got to continue to keep it clean and build new trails. And we really need that funding source. We do. Um, and we've been, again, kind of going back to the strategic plan, really focused on achieving those focus areas. You know, first responder, we're in really good condition there. That Great. Of course, police and fire. I often say businesses or residents don't move to a community that's not safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've invested in that area. Uh, and then our infrastructure, again, really proud about our continued investment in infrastructure. Um, most people think of that as transportation, but I would also submit parks and trail networks, things of that nature, and really recognizing them as an asset to the community and continue to invest. And why I say invest, not just spend money, is there's an anticipation of a return on that investment. Mm -hmm. And that's building a healthy community that people are proud of. And we're, look, we're looked upon as that, and that's what we, we're proud of. Um, to, and it takes significant discipline uh, to invest in some, some of that is, is boring infrastructure, <laughs> maybe some of that that you don't even see underground, but we, the, we have to invest in that. We've done yeah. a good job over the recent years. We've had some rains recently, some pretty heavy rains that have, that always challenges some of the stormwater systems and things like that, but um, saw lots of crew out cleaning things up and repairing things and it's nice to see there's enough people to get that stuff done. We've been, we try to stay really uh, nimble and adaptive that I think of 2020 didn't teach us anything. It taught us that. And we have excellent staff and uh, they know their jobs. And uh, sometimes we have to put them in a different area and they're really adaptive to that. I'll just mention one example. We didn't have Orchard Mesa Pool open about four, 14, 15 months ago when this uh, first started. And so we did we redeployed those staff members to our parks and actually our parks saw considerable utilization mm -hmm. uh, last, uh, last summer and continue this, the recreation all elements is really been a post -pan pandemic and then post pandemic. If we can say maybe we're post, but I don't fingers crossed <laughs> is uh, yeah. really given a boost and a level of heightened importance to parks and recreate parks and recreation. I believe and particularly that outdoor recreation. Mm -hmm. That's about all people could do for a while. And so it was really encouraged. And we just need to make sure that we have those assets and uh, amenities yeah. really for our residents. We build them for our residents and then uh, tourists or guests in our community get to utilize them. But we need to build those. But they for become our residents. Mm -hmm. You know, we saw that a lot during the pandemic, people coming from the mountain saying, I'm going to, down to Grand Junction to ride my bike. And wow, this is this place is pretty cool. I haven't really gotten off the highway that much. And once they come into our downtown and some of the special places around here, they start to think, you know, I could live here. You know, uh, the leisure traveler is is often a gateway into business investment and permanent residency, and and many communities have seen that, and we're starting to see that. We're mm -hmm. we're we are on the map, as you yeah. mentioned earlier, and seeing significant interest. Uh, also, we're on the we're being. Uh, discussed more uh, at the statewide level and even beyond that. Um, we are the we are the metropolitan area and on the western slope, and yeah. I think it's important for us to have our voice at the table. That's another thing we've worked really hard at the last couple of years. Well, I think you've done a great job, Greg. I'm really impressed with all the projects that you've been able to manage. I don't know how you do it because there is, sure is a lot going on. Um, in the just couple minutes that we have left, um, talk a little bit about the Dos Rios side mm -hmm. over there because there's so much activity and I'm sure people every day when they drive by it think, what's next, what's next? Well, I do have to give credit. Uh, first, when you said we have a lot of projects to our city staff, just phenomenal. Uh, it's 700 plus employees doing just an excellent job uh, each and every day. And then also to our city council. You know, our city council, they're in mm -hmm. our our form of government, they're the board of directors, city manager serves as the CEO for the organization. And I, this is my business. I've been in this for uh, over 24 years, but great leadership from our city council. So um, 
a staff saw many years ago a cleanup opportunity back when there were junk cars mm -hmm. on uh, Dos Rios, and they were going to move the junk cars off and clean up the site and move the junk cars back. And they said, well, maybe you can just find a, a new home for the junk cars. <laughs> and I know many staff, including city attorney who's been here over 30 years, worked really hard on that. And so then we owned the site, and sat fallow, sat uh, empty for many years. And then when I got here, I, I kind of joked that we were land rich and cash poor <laughs> in uh, 2016. So we started to look at opportunities with that land that we owned. And uh, we, we really thought if we put in the infrastructure, and often people think we're in the – or accuse us, I'll say it that way, of being in the development business, we're not. What we do is form public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. and what we do is develop horizontal infrastructure. And then the private sector comes in and develops the vertical infrastructure. So through a very creative uh, financing mechanism, through a general improvement district, and also uh, doing some tax increment financing, we finance the infrastructure for $10.7 million. That will be complete within about uh, 45 to 60 days. And then we sold the property. So we found a buyer of it, actually two buyers. We often mention the second buyer. The first buyer has been uh, Jen Taylor, bought it some time ago. Uh, but then the second buyer was out of Denver and then found a, a new partner mm -hmm. who has great vision for the property. And yeah. we also developed the vision. So we developed the infrastructure, a little bit of vision, and wanted to hand it off to the private sector. So uh, we sold it for $4.3 million, and they pulled down just a portion of it, a little over $1.8 million that they own and mm -hmm. paid, us, paid us for that. And then we'll see uh, about $100 million investment over the next 10 years. Incredible. We'll, we'll first start to see the investment in Long Hale along the northern part of our pro the property, working to the south, there'll be a lot of uh, residential and a lot of density. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that density we spoke about earlier. So townhomes, condos, apartments. And then when you get more to the core, creating some more public space. Mm -hmm. So we're going to invest about another million dollars in some public space. So the public will still be able to use the beautiful bicycle playground, the public space, and we're exploring maybe a beach-type opportunity. Uh, and then in that core, then you'll see some commercial activity. So probably by the fourth quarter of 2021, we'll see some activity. And then really in 2022, you'll see a lot of activity down there. Super exciting. And I love that you can ride your bike to connect all of these things. I mean, all the way out to Palisade and all the way out to Loma and Mac. It's incredible what we've created here. So it's really just a great community and everybody yeah. with that same vision. Um, yeah. We have so many great partners. Uh, we couldn't do this by ourselves, and they couldn't do it by themselves, and we're all really moving in that same direction. Residents, these major institutions, major businesses, it's just uh, very thriving right now. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, if uh, our listeners or our viewers want to get in touch with you, uh, should they just go to the gjcity.org website and that's look a, you up? That sounds good. Do you want, so, do you want to announce your email address <laughs> I <here>? do. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I, you can just go to the website, the city manager email. Also, my phone number, uh, 244-1508. And so uh, we get so much feedback, uh, positive, constructive, everything in between all day long. And I, I just tell a quick story the other day. Somebody called and, and uh, I said, that's a good idea. And he said, wow, I didn't. But it, well, one, I didn't expect you to call me back. And two, I didn't expect you to be so responsive. We're here to serve the community. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you. We appreciate you. You bet. Great job. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. And thanks to Greg Caton. And we will catch you next time on the Full Circle Podcast. Have a great day. Thanks for listening. This is Christy Reese signing out from the Full Circle Podcast. <laughs>